One of the most decisive battles in the history of India took place in the year 1761. How did the battle between the Maratha Empire and the invading Afghan army influence Indian history? Hello and welcome to UPSC History Review. Today, let's learn about the Third Battle of Panipat. The Third Battle of Panipat took place on 14th January 1761 at Panipat about 60 miles north of Delhi between the Maratha Empire and the invading Afghan army supported by four Indian allies, the Rohilas under the command of Najib Uddullah, Afghans of the Doab region and the Nawab of Awad, Shuja Uddullah. The Maratha army was led by Shadashiv Rao Bhau who was third in authority after the Chhatrapati Maratha king and the Peshwa Maratha prime minister. The main Maratha army was stationed in Deccan with the Peshwa. Militarily, the battle pitted the artillery and cavalry of the Marathas against the heavy cavalry and mounted artillery of the Afghans and Rohilas, led by Abdali and Najib Uddawla, both ethnic Afghans. The battle is considered one of the largest and most eventful fought in the 18th century and it has perhaps the largest number of fatalities in a single day reported in a classic formation battle between two armies. The specific site of the battle itself is disputed by historians, but most consider it to have occurred somewhere near modern-day Kala Amb and Sanauli Road. The battle lasted for several days and involved over 125,000 troops. Protracted skirmishes occurred with losses and gains on both sides. The forces led by Ahmad Shah Durrani came out victorious after destroying several Maratha flanks. The extent of the losses on both sides is heavily disputed by historians, but it is believed that between 60,000 to 70,000 were killed in fighting, while the numbers of injured and prisoners taken vary considerably. According to the single best eyewitness chronicle, the Bakhar by Shuja Uddawla's Diwan Kashi Raj, about 40,000 Maratha prisoners were slaughtered in cold blood the day after the battle. Grand Duff includes an interview of a survivor of these massacres in his History of the Marathas and generally corroborates this number. Shej Walker, whose monograph Panipat 1761 is often regarded as the single best secondary source on the battle says that not less than 100,000 Marathas perished during and after the battle, which includes soldiers and non-combatants. Let's take a look at the background of the Third War of Panipat. The Decline of the Mughal Empire The 27-year-old Mughal Maratha War 1680-1707 led to rapid territorial loss of the Maratha Empire to the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb. However, after his death in 1707, this process reversed following the Mughal succession war between the sons of Aurangzeb. By 1712, Marathas quickly started retaking their lost lands. Under Peshwa Bajirao, Gujarat, Malwa and Rajputana came under Maratha control. Finally, in 1737, Peshwa Bajirao defeated the Mughals on the outskirts of Delhi and brought much of the former Mughal territories south of Agra under Maratha control. Bajirao's son Balaji Bajirao further increased the territory under Maratha control by invading Punjab in 1758. Let's take a look at Raghunath Rao's letter to the Peshwa on 4th May 1758. Lahore, Multan and other subas on eastern side of Atok are under our rule for the most part and places which have not come under our rule we shall soon bring under us. Ahmad Shah Durrani's son Timur Shah Durrani and Jahan Khan have been pursued by our troops and their troops completely looted. Both of them have now reached Peshawar with a few broken troops. So Ahmad Shah Durrani has returned to Kandahar with some 12 to 14 thousand broken troops. Thus all have risen against Ahmad who has lost control over the region. We have decided to extend our rule up to Kandahar. Here ends the letter from Raghunath Rao to the Peshwa. 
This brought the Marathas into direct confrontation with the Durrani Empire of Ahmad Shah Abdali. In 1759, he raised an army from the Pashtun and Baloch tribes and made several gains against the smaller Maratha garrisons in Punjab. He then joined with his Indian allies, the Rohila Afghans of the Gangetic Doab, forming a broad coalition against the Marathas. To counter this, Raghunath Rao was supposed to go north to handle the situation. Raghunath Rao asked for a large amount of money and an army which was denied by Sadashiv Rao Bhau, his cousin and Diwan of Peshwa. Hence Raghunath Rao declined to go. Sadashiv Rao Bhau was thereupon made commander-in-chief of the Maratha army under whom the Battle of Panipat was fought. The Marathas under the command of Sadashiv Rao Bhau responded by gathering an army of between 45,000 to 60,000 men which was accompanied by roughly 200,000 non-combatants, a number of whom were pilgrims desirous of making pilgrimages to Hindu holy sites in northern India. The Marathas started their northward journey from Paddur on 14th March 1760. Both sides tried to get the Nawab of Awad, Shuja Uddawla, into their camp. By late July, Shuja Uddawla made the decision to join the Afghan Rohila coalition, preferring to join what was perceived as the Army of Islam. This was strategically a major loss for the Marathas since Shuja provided much-needed finances for the long Afghan stay in North India. It is doubtful whether the Afghan Rohila coalition would have the means to continue their conflict with the Marathas without Shuja's support. Let's learn about the rise of the Marathas. Grant Duff hereby described the Maratha army as The lofty and spacious tents, lined with silks and broadcloths, were surmounted by large gilded ornaments conspicuous at a distance. Vast numbers of elephants, flags of all description, the finest horses, magnificently caparisoned, seemed to be collected from every quarter. It was an imitation of the more becoming and tasteful array of the Mughals in the zenith of their glory. Here ends the description of the Maratha army by Grant Duff. The Marathas had gained control of a considerable part of India in the intervening period 1712 to 1757. In 1758, they nominally occupied Delhi, captured Lahore and drove out Timur Shah Durrani, the son and viceroy of the Afghan ruler Ahmed Shah Abdali. This was the high water mark of Maratha expansion, where the boundaries of their empire extended north of the Sindhu River all the way down south to northern Kerala. This territory was ruled through the Peshwa, who talked of placing his son Vishwas Rao on the Mughal throne. However, Delhi still remained under the control of Mughals, key Muslim intellectuals including Shah Waliullah and other Muslim clergies in India were frightened at these developments. In desperation, they appealed Ahmad Shah Abdali, the ruler of Afghanistan, to halt the threat. Let's take a look at the prelude of the Third War of Panipat. Ahmad Shah Durrani, angered by the news from his son and his allies, was unwilling to allow the Maratha spread go unchecked. By the end of 1759, Abdali with his Afghan tribes, his Baloch allies, and his Rohila ally Najib Khan had reached Lahore as well as Delhi and defeated the smaller enemy garrisons. Ahmed Shah at this point withdrew his army to Anup Shahar on the frontier of the Rohila country where he successfully convinced the Nawab of Aud Shuja Uddawla to join his alliance against the Marathas. The Marathas had earlier helped Sabdar Jung in defeating Rohilas at Farukkabad. Sabdar Jung was the father of Shuja Uddawla. The Marathas under Sadashiv Rao Bhau responded to the news of the Afghans return to North India by raising an army, and they marched north. Bhau's force was bolstered by some Maratha forces under Holkar, Skindia, Gaikwad, and Govind Pant Bandele. Surajmal, the Jat ruler of Bharatpur, also had joined 
Bhau Saheb initially. This combined army captured the Mughal capital Delhi from an Afghan garrison in December 1759. Delhi had been reduced to ashes many times due to previous invasions and in addition there being acute shortage of supplies in the Maratha camp. Bhau ordered the sacking of the already depopulated city. He is said to have planned to place his nephew and the Peshwa's son Vishwas Rao on the Delhi throne. The Jats withdrew their support from the Marathas. Their withdrawal from the ensuing battle was to play a crucial role in its result. Abdali drew first blood by attacking a small Maratha army led by Dattaji Shinde at Burari Ghat. Dattaji was killed in the battle. Let's learn about the Afghan defeat at Kunjpura. With both sides poised for battle, there followed much maneuvering, with skirmishes between the two armies fought at Karnal and Kunjpura. Kunjpura, on the banks of the Yamuna River, 60 miles to the north of Delhi, was stormed by the Marathas and the whole Afghan garrison was killed or enslaved. The Marathas achieved a rather easy victory at Kunjpura against an army of 15,000 Afghans posted there. Some of Abdali's best generals like Najabat Khan were killed. Ahmad Shah was encamped on the left bank of the Yamuna River, which was swollen by rains and was powerless to aid the garrison. The massacre of the Kunjpura garrison within sight of the Durani camp exasperated Abdali to such an extent that he ordered crossing of the river at all costs. Let's learn about the Afghans crossing the Yamuna. Ahmed Shah and his allies on 17th October 1760 broke up from Shah Dara marching south. Taking a calculated risk, Abdali plunged into the river, followed by his bodyguards and troops. Between 23rd and 25th October, they were able to cross at Bagpat, a small town about 24 miles up the river, unopposed by the Marathas who were still preoccupied with the sacking of Kunjpura. After the Marathas failed to prevent Abdali's forces from crossing the Yamuna River, they set up defensive works in the ground near Panipat, thereby blocking his access back to Afghanistan just as Abdali's forces blocked theirs to the south. However, on the afternoon of 26 October, Ahmed Shah's advance guard reached Sambalka, about halfway between Sonepat and Panipat, where they encountered the vanguard of the Marathas. A fierce skirmish ensued, in which the Afghans lost 1,000 men but drove the Marathas back to their main body, which kept retreating slowly for several days. This led to the partial encirclement of the Maratha army. In skirmishes that followed, Govind Pant Bandele, with 10,000 light cavalry who weren't formally trained soldiers, was on a foraging mission with about 500 men. They were surprised by an Afghan force near Mirut and in the ensuing fight, Bandele was killed. This was followed by the loss of a contingent of 2,000 Maratha soldiers who had left Delhi to deliver money and rations to Panipat. This completed the encirclement as Ahmed Shah had cut off the Maratha army's supply lines. With supplies and stores dwindling, tensions started rising in the Maratha camp. Initially, the Marathas had moved in almost 150 pieces of modern long-range French-made artillery. With a range of several kilometers, these guns were some of the best of the time. The Marathas' plans was to lure the Afghan army to confront them while they had close artillery support. Let's take a look at the preliminary moves taken during the battle. During the next two months of the siege, constant skirmishes and duels took place between units from the two sides. In one of these, Najib lost 3,000 of his Rohilas and was nearly killed himself. Facing a potential stalemate, Abdali decided to seek terms which Bhau was willing to consider. However, Najib Khan delayed any chance of an agreement with an appeal on religious grounds and sowed doubt about whether the Marathas would honor any agreement. After the Marathas moved from Kunjpura to Panipat, Diler Khan Marwat with his father Alam Khan Marwat and a force of 2,500 Pashtuns 
attacked and took control of Kunjpura, where there was a Maratha garrison of 700 to 800 soldiers. At that time, Atai Khan Baluch, son of Shah Wali Khan, the Wazir of Abdali, came from Afghanistan with 10,000 cavalry and cut off the supplies to the Marathas. The Marathas at Panipat were surrounded by Abdali in the south, Pashtun tribes, Yusufzai, Afridi and Khatak in the east, Shuja, Atai Khan and others in the north, and other Pashtun tribes, Gandapur, Marwat, Duranis and Kakars in the west. Unable to continue without supplies or wait for reinforcements any longer, Bhau decided to break the siege. His plan was to pulverize the enemy formations with cannon fire and not to employ his cavalry until the Afghans were thoroughly softened up. With the Afghans broken, he would move camp in a defensive formation towards Delhi where they were assured supplies. Let's learn about the formations taken during the battle. With the Maratha chiefs pressurizing Sadashiv Rao Bhau to go to battle rather than perish by starvation, on 13 January, the Marathas left their camp before dawn and marched south towards the Afghan camp in a desperate attempt to break the siege. The two armies came face to face around 8 am. The Maratha lines began a little to the north of Kala Amb. They had thus blocked the northward path of Abdali's troops and at the same time were blocked from heading south in the direction of Delhi, where they could get badly needed supplies by those same troops. Bhau, with the Peshwa's son and the royal guard Huzurat, was in the center. The left wing consisted of the guardies under Ibrahim Khan. Holkar and Sindhya were on the extreme right. The Maratha line was formed up some 12 kilometers across, with the artillery in front, protected by infantry, pikemen, musketeers, and bowmen. The cavalry was instructed to wait behind the artillery and bayonet-wielding musketeers ready to be thrown in when control of the battlefield had been fully established. Behind this line was another ring of 30,000 young Maratha soldiers who were not battle-tested, and then the civilians. Many were ordinary men, women and children on their pilgrimage to Hindu holy places and shrines. Behind the civilians was yet another protective infantry line of young, inexperienced soldiers. On the other side of the Afghans formed a somewhat similar line a few meters to the south of today's Sanauli Road. Their left was being formed by Najib and their right by two brigades of troops. Their left center was led by two viziers, Shuja Uddullah with 3000 soldiers and 50 to 60 cannons and Ahmed Shah's vizier Shah Wali with a choice body of 19,000 mailed Afghan horsemen. The right center consisted of 15,000 Rohilas under Hafiz Ramath and other chiefs of the Rohila Pathans. Pasant Khan covered the left wing with 5,000 cavalry, Barghurdar Khan and Amir Beg covered the right with 3,000 Rohila cavalry. Long range musketeers were also present during the battle. In this order, the army of Ahmed Shah moved forward, leaving him at his preferred post in the center which was now in the rear of the line from where he could watch and direct the battle. Let's take a look at the battle. The Early Phases Before dawn on 14 January 1761, the Maratha troops broke their fast with sugared water in the camp and prepared for combat. They emerged from the trenches, pushing the artillery into position on their prearranged lines some 2 km from the Afghans. Seeing the battle was on, Ahmed Shah positioned his 60 smoothbore cannon and opened fire. The initial attack was led by the Maratha left flank under Ibrahim Khan, who advanced his infantry in formation against the Rohilas and Shah Prasant Khan. The first salvos from the Maratha artillery went over the Afghans' heads and did very little damage. Nevertheless, the first Afghan attack by Najib Khan's Rohilas was broken by Maratha bowmen and pikemen along with a unit of the famed Gardi musketeers stationed close to the artillery positions. The second and subsequent salvos were fired at point-blank range into the Afghan ranks. The resulting carnage sent the Rohilas reeling back to their lines, 
leaving the battlefield in the hands of Ibrahim for the next three hours, during which 8,000 Gardi musketeers killed about 12,000 Rohilas. In the second phase, Bhau himself led the charge against the left of center Afghan forces under the Afghan vizier Shah Wali Khan. The sheer force of the attack nearly broke the Afghan lines and the Afghan soldiers started to desert their positions in the confusion. Desperately trying to rally his forces, Shah Wali appeared to Shuja Uddaullah for assistance. However, the Nawab did not break from his position, effectively splitting the Afghan forces center. Despite Bhau's success and the ferocity of the charge, the attack did not attain complete success as many of the half-starved Maratha mounts were exhausted. Also, there were no heavy armoured cavalry units for the Marathas to maintain these openings. In order to turn about the deserting Afghan troopers, Abdali deployed his Nashkibi musketeers to gun down the deserters who finally stopped and returned to the field. Let's take a look at the final phase of the third battle of Panipat. The Marathas under Skindia attacked Najib. Najib successfully fought a defensive action, however, keeping Skindia's forces at bay. By noon, it looked as though Bhau would clinch victory for the Marathas once again. The Afghan left flank still held its own, but the center was cut in two and the right was almost destroyed. Ahmed Shah had watched the fortunes of the battle from his tent, guarded by the still unbroken forces on his left. He sent his bodyguards to call up his 15,000 reserve troops from his camp and arrange them as a column in front of his cavalry of musketeers, and 2,000 swivel mounted Shuternals or Ushranal cannons on the backs of camels. The Shuternals, because of their positioning on the camels, could fire an extensive salvo over the heads of their own infantry at the Maratha cavalry. The Maratha cavalry was unable to withstand the muskets and camel-mounted swivel cannons of the Afghans. They could be fired without the rider having to dismount and were especially effective against fast-moving cavalry. Abdali therefore sent 500 of his own bodyguards with orders to raise all able-bodied men out of camp and send them to the front. He sent 1500 more to punish the frontline troops who attempted to flee the battle and kill without mercy any soldier who would not return to the fight. These extra troops, along with 4000 of his reserve troops, went to support the broken ranks of the Rohilas on the right. The remainder of the reserve, 10,000 strong, were sent to the aid of Shah Wali, still laboring unequally against the Bhau in the center of the field. These mailed warriors were to charge with the vizier in close order and at full gallop. Whenever they charged the enemy in front, the chief of the staff and Najib were directed to fall upon either flank. With their own men in the firing line, the Maratha artillery could not respond to the Shaturnals and the cavalry charge. Some 7,000 Maratha cavalry and infantry were killed before the hand-to-hand -hand fighting began at around 1400 hours. By 1600 hours, the tired Maratha infantry began to succumb to the onslaught of attacks from fresh Afghan reserves, protected by armored leather jackets. Let's see the last phase of the battle when Marathas were outflanked. Sadashiv Rao Bhau, who had not kept any reserves, seeing his forward lines dwindling, civilians behind and upon seeing Vishwas Rao disappear in the midst of the fighting, felt he had no choice but to come down from his elephant and lead the battle. Taking advantage of this, the Afghan soldiers who had been captured by the Marathas earlier during the siege of Kunjpura revolted. The prisoners unwrapped their green bells and wore them as turbans to impersonate the troops of the Durrani Empire and began attacking from within. This brought confusion and great consternation to the Maratha soldiers, who thought that the enemy had attacked from the rear. Some Maratha troops in the vanguard, seeing that their general had disappeared from his elephant and the chaos ensuing in the rear, panicked and scattered in disarray towards the rear. 
Abdali had given a part of his army the task of surrounding and killing the guardies who were at the leftmost part of the Maratha army. Bhau Saheb had ordered Vithal Vinchurkar and Damaji Gaikwad to protect the guardies. However, after seeing the guardies having no clearing for directing their cannons fire at the enemy troops, they lost their patience and decided to fight the Rohilas themselves. Thus, they broke their position and went all out on the Rohilas. The Rohila riflemen started accurately firing at the Maratha cavalry which was equipped only with swords. This gave the Rohilas the opportunity to encircle the guardies and outflank the Maratha center while Shah Wali pressed on attacking the front. Thus, the guardies were left defenseless and started falling one by one. Vishwas Rao had already been killed by a shot to the head. Bhau and the Huzurati royal forces fought till the end, the Maratha leader having three horses shot out from under him. At this stage, the Holkar and Skindia contingents, realizing the battle was lost, merged their forces with one contingent breaking from the Maratha right flank and escaped from the opening in the Durani lines southward, as Jankoji Rao Skindia led the other contingent to reinforce the thinning lines of Marathas. The Maratha front lines remained largely intact with some of their artillery units fighting until sunset. Choosing not to launch a night attack, many Maratha troops escaped that night. Bhau's wife Parvati Bhai, who was assisting in the administration of the Maratha camp, escaped to Pune with her bodyguard. Janu Bhintada along with Nana Fadnavis under the protection of Malvar Rao Holkar's contingent. Some 15,000 soldiers managed to reach Gwalior. Let's learn about the legacy of the third battle of Panipat. The valor displayed by the Marathas was extolled by Ahmed Shah Abdali in his letter to his ally Madho Singh, the king of Jaipur. He wrote, the Marathas fought with the greatest valor which was beyond the capacity of other races. These dauntless bloodshedders did not fall short in fighting and doing glorious deeds. Suddenly the breeze of victory began to blow, and the wretched Deccanese suffered defeat, he wrote. The third battle of Panipat saw an enormous number of deaths and injuries in a single day of battle. It was the last major battle between South Asian-headed military powers until the creation of Pakistan and India in 1947. To save their kingdom, the Mughals once again changed sides and welcomed the Afghans to Delhi. The Mughals remained in nominal control over small areas of India but were never a force again. The empire officially ended in 1857 when its last Mughal emperor Bahadur Shah II was accused of being involved in the Indian rebellion and exiled. The Maratha's expansion was delayed due to the battle, and the damage done to the Maratha moral from the initial defeat caused infighting to break out within the empire. They recovered their position under the next Peshwa Madhav Rao I and were back in control of the north, finally occupying Delhi by 1771. However, after the death of Madhav Rao, Due to infighting and external conflicts with the East India Company, their political status as an empire only officially ended in 1818 after three wars against the forces of the East India Company. Meanwhile, the Sikhs, whose rebellion was the original reason Ahmed invaded, were left largely untouched by the battle. They soon retook Lahore, and when Ahmed Shah returned in March 1764, he was forced to break off his siege after only two weeks due to a rebellion in Afghanistan. He returned again in 1767 but was unable to win any decisive battle. With his own troops complaining about not being paid, he eventually lost the region to the Sikh Khalsa Raj, who remained in control until 1849 when it was annexed by the East India Company. The battle was referred to in Rudyard Kipling's poem, with Skindia to Delhi. Our hands and scarves were saffron dyed for signal of despair, when we went forth to Panipat to battle with the Mlek, ere we came back from Panipat and left the kingdom there. It is however also remembered as a scene of valor on both sides. Atai Khan, the adopted son of the Wazi Shawali Khan, 
was said to have been killed during this time when Yashwant Rao Power climbed atop his elephant and struck him down. Santa Jiwak's corpse was found with over 40 mortal wounds. Thank you for listening to this discussion on the third battle of Panipat. For more such discussions, get the UPSC Practice app from the App Store.